Hello, I'm Jeremy Fiebig. Welcome to the Sweet Tea Shakespeare Hours, where we spend time well by spending it together. Uh, hello, lovely listeners. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Claire Martin, and I'm the Assistant Artistic Director of Sweet Tea Shakespeare. And I'm here with the Artistic Director, uh, Jeremy Fiebig and the amazing Kelly Artist, and we are launching uh, a podcast series that we're very excited about, in which we are going to uh, type Shakespeare characters using the Enneagram system, uh, and this is the first episode, and we're really excited to share share our discoveries with you. So um, I want to start by uh, giving a quick shout out to the Arts Council of Fayetteville and Cumberland County. Thank you so much for enabling us to launch this really exciting series uh, and just for continuing to support the arts in our community. We're really grateful um, because we've been looking forward to this for a long time. So just so you guys can get to know us a little bit better, uh, we're just gonna tell you our names, uh, the Enneagram type that we think we fall under and our favorite Shakespeare play. And then we will take it from there. So Jeremy, do you wanna go first? I will be happy to go first. I'm Jeremy, hello. Um, I am an Enneagram one or three or four or five or eight. I think that's, I think those are the options. Um, We're going to figure that I'm out. I'm excited about this process so that I can do some self-discovery. Um, I be, I listen to a lot of Enneagram stuff. I read a lot of Enneagram stuff and uh, like I end up openly weeping because I identify with so many of them as they describe describe things. So, um, yeah, I'm excited about this process. My favorite Shakespeare play uh, for the longest period of time, it sometimes changes, but uh, for the longest period of time has been The Tempest. Um, and so there you go. I don't know what that says about me. Maybe Tempest <laughs> lovers are, are fours or something. I figured no. Knowing your your Inia confusion, that would be the longest answer <laughs> with all of the numbers. So, hey, everybody, I'm a I'm Kelly. I'm an Enneagram five, uh, very decidedly. Uh, it's extremely clear, and I, I'm going to share a photo later of we were preparing for this episode, this recording. I had literally I have a dining room size table desk, of course, and I had like eight ish books all spread out and I was just laughing at myself because that's a five thing. Um, so anyway, yeah, I'm an Enneagram five and what favorite Shakespeare play. This is also going to be indicative. So they brought me into this conversation because of my enthusiasm for the Enneagram and decidedly not because of my knowledge of Shakespeare. Uh, so you guys are going to laugh. I would have said Romeo and Juliet because yes, I'll be that girl. That'll be me. Um, but I have to say, I saw um, the Scottish play in the spring and I think that may be my new fave. It was fantastic. So It was my favorite for a long, long time. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, I All right. think that's a sign. I think that's a good sign, Jeremy, that you moved from the dark, bloody Scottish play into like the hope and like rejuvenation of the Tempest. I think that marks like a good thing happening in your soul. Growth. Growth. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm an adult now, so <laughs> here we are. What about you, Claire? Um. So my my I'm the, I'm the inverse of Kelly. In, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I was I was brought in not because passion for the Enneagram system or even my knowledge of it, but because of my um, kind of knowledge of the plethora of Shakespeare characters uh, that exist. And so um, I know that I am an eight only because uh, every quiz I have taken has told me that I am an eight. And every time, every description that I read, uh, I find myself nodding to myself the most when I read the eight description. So I'm assuming that's what I am. We're going to get that probably either confirmed or problematized later. Um, <laughs> And uh, my favorite Shakespeare play is Henry V. Um, so that is us. Uh, we're so excited to, to do this. So without further ado, um, Kelly, if you wouldn't mind, could you please just tell our listeners a little bit about the Enneagram system, uh, what it is, and how, how it can be used? Okay, so there's no real quick way to do this, guys. So just bear with me if it seems like really reductive or simplistic. If you're a fan of the Enneagram or you know much about it, I'm going to try to just break it down into a bite-sized sort of chunk. Um, a lot of people will refer to it as a personality typology system, 
I will say it's way more than that, but if that helps you kind of conceptualize what we're talking about, that's fine. Um, so it is essentially a system, a model, um, an image, it's like a diagram, literally. Inia means nine and gram is drawing or graphic or image. Um, so it is a shape that helps kind of overlay and outline nine different archetypes of personality structures. Um, there are tons of significance. There's a lot of significance with numerology and like groupings of numbers. So you'll see it's nine numbers and nine types, um, but they're also grouped in various ways of threes and um, the circle has meaning and there, there's all kinds of um, triads at play. Um, so essentially you are one of nine numbers. No, Jeremy, you are not a little bit of all four. <laughs> um, you have a type. Let me also say you're not a type. You have a type. You are dominant in a certain type. Um, but the types also, each of the numbers touch four other numbers on the diagram, um, on this, on the model. So that's where some of the confusion often comes is, is people will take a test. Um, and the tests are a great entry point, but they're often, it's really hard to capture a human being, uh, with a 50 question test. Right. So, um, there's always going to be nuance and fluidity and the system allows for that. Um, so if you're just getting started with the Enneagram, be patient with it. It is work. It takes a long time. It's a lot of self, -aware self awareness, self discovery, um, that we often are just kind of asleep to. So, so what the system does, though, is it really neatly and kind of um, eerily, eerily packages up uh, the coping mechanisms for each of the nine different types of people that are out there. Um, so as I, we were talking, I am a five. I know that I have um, influences of the two numbers on either side of me. And then I also know what I look like in health. Um, when I'm doing well or when I'm behaving badly or unhealthy in my type and then using the system, I can also see where I'm reaching. So if I'm in a, in a good space and looking to grow, um, I can reach to eight actually Claire. Um, or I can also reach to seven if I'm in stress and need extra coping mechanisms or extra tools, um, to get me through something that is taxing my, kind of go go to and defaults. So nine numbers. Um, we're going to talk about type one today, which is the perfectionist. Um, I'll spin around the circle really quickly, just so you guys know the names of each of the types. But the reason there are numbers and, and often not names is because numbers are really non-judgmental. Um, it's not a spectrum, like it's not a scale, right, where you can be like ones are goods and nines are bad. It's not like that. It's just kind of, they're just labeled around this, around the outside of the circle. Um, the ones are the perfectionists. The twos are the helpers. The threes are the achievers or performers. Uh, the four is the individualist or romantic. Um, the five is the observer, or the investigator. The six is the loyalist. The seven is the enthusiast. The eight is the challenger. <laughs> um, and then the nine is the peacemaker. Okay, so we were just talking about um, how each number has four other points of contact on the system. So you have the opportunity to reach into sort of another tool set or another bucket um, of character traits, coping mechanisms to try to help you either move gracefully through a stressful situation or um, kind of continue down a path of growth um, to become a more fully aware and uh, compassionate human being. So that's kind of what the system is in a nutshell. Um, that is a very brief uh, nutshell. And we're going to go through other dynamics and pieces of the system as we talk through each of the nine types. So stay tuned for all of the conversations so um, we can try to cover um, in more detail and depth um, some of the different facets. So thank you. So today we are doing uh, for our first episode, we are looking at type one. Um, because the beginning is a very good place to start. <laughs> and so type one is called, am I right? The reformer or the perfectionist. Yep. Either, either and or, and or. yeah, both, yeah, both um, are used. I'm both of those things. Sure. You are. <laughs> um, so Kelly, can you walk us through type one a little bit, please? Yeah. So, and Jeremy brings up a good point. So the Enneagram isn't so much about your characteristics, right? It, or your behaviors. It's about your motivations. So just because you can be a perfectionist, you can be a perfectionist in nine different ways for nine different reasons, right? So ones are often kind of stereotyped as like wanting to keep checklists and have systems in order. I have checklists and I keep an 
order or a system that a one would call disordered, right? (laughs) But we all kind of do these things, right? And it doesn't necessarily make you that type. So the one, um, as mentioned, is called the reformer, um, oftentimes called the perfectionist. They are in the body triad. So these are instinctual folks. They learn, they listen to their environment. They perceive the world through their bodies. Um, So the, the three types of triads are head, heart, gut, right? thinkers, feelers, doers. Um, so these are your doers, your body folks. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to hit some like key points for each of the types to try to make sure that we're being consistent across the board. Um, and if you guys want extra clarification on any of this, I'm happy to dive in. And I'm sure once we start talking about the characters, I can maybe peel that apart a little more. So, um, each of the triads has sort of a core emotion that drives them to action. Uh, for the one, it is anger. Now, what that looks like for a one is that it's internalized anger. So wrong face, Jeremy. You wouldn't see it (laughs) on a one. It's internalized. I'm angry on the inside. Yeah. So it often um, comes out as frustration, resentment. Um, The ones really, really struggle with this inner critic. So their core desire, their core motivation from everything that they do in life is to be good. Um, And then the core fear of a type is often the inverse of the desire. So it seems simplistic, but it really is pretty deep. Um, The core fear of a one is of being bad or corrupt or defective in some way. So ones are the folks that can walk into a room and feel that something is off and know it in their bones. Um, It could be as minor as the picture frame, a little crooked. Um, or it could be something way bigger than that. Um, but they do have a way of kind of intuiting their situation, their surrounding. Um, and the, the kind of the bummer for everyone around a one is that they're often right because they just are. Um, so, you know, a one be careful before you pick a fight with them because they're probably going to eventually turn out to be right. Um, they are oriented around the present. So there's different types of orientations to time. So ones are really focused on the here and now. Um, What in this moment can I fix? Um, Can I make better? Because that is kind of their like obsession. Um, Others are past and future oriented. We'll get to those later. Um, They have wings. So the numbers to either side of a number is called your wing, right? So these are essentially traits and behaviors that you have access to. Um, They're not, they don't affect your core motivation, but you can see like flares, right, of either side. So the the one is in between, the nine, the peacemaker, and the two, the helper. So you could either have a little bit of both. You can have no wing, like really nothing really shows up, or you could usually people have one that's more dominant than the other. So when you see an Enneagram speak, you'll see people say, I'm a one W two. It means they're a one with a two wing. Um, And what that looks like in different ways is it kind of balances out their Um, core traits. So for the one with a nine wing, so who has the peacemaker influence, um, they're often called the idealist. So these are big picture thinkers. Um, They're abstract dreamers, um, and they can get a little detached, um, but they're also super discerning. Um, The one with a two wing is often called the advocate. So these folks are more um, relationship driven. They're more compassionate about the things that they want to fix. Right. So just a solid one is like, everything's on fire. I want to fix it all. Right. And then with the influences of the two wings, it can kind of bring out different dynamics um, for that type. Uh, We can talk about stress and security a little bit later. I did jot down some pop culture ones for people to kind of like have as a reference. Um, So one of my favorite new shows, uh, (laughs) fiction, obviously, or, you know, it's just a TV show, um, is The Good Place. So do you guys know Chidi Adegonye, the ethics professor? Chidi's a one. Chidi's a hardcore one. And what's so funny about the fact that Chidi, spoiler, Spoiler. skip ahead if you haven't caught up on The Good Place, but if you know Chidi thinks he's in The Good Place because he's good, but the fact is that his fixations and all of his struggles, his his, they call them passions in Enneagram speak, which is anger, um, Um, kept him from actually forming meaningful relationships because because no one could meet his expectations. So he ended up eventually in the bad place. So anyway, sorry, just spoiled that for you guys. Um, Another one is Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec. Right? right? The binder oh, queen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, those are kind of fun um, little comparisons. But yeah, so I'll, I'll leave that there. I know that was kind of brief, but um, 
yeah. What do you guys think? That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So, Jeremy, I think you said that you had about seven characters. <laughs> yes, and I identify with them all. Um, uh, I believe I've, I've actually played two of them. So I'm going to start with me. which it worries me. That you, it worries me. That you identify with some of them. Don't you have like murderers on your list? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look, but we're not going to talk about that. There are bad ones. <laughs> Doesn't I mean, mean they have to, maybe they think they're, they're doing that for a good reason, right? That you can definitely be unhealthy and disordered. <laughs> absolutely. Um, the top of my list, uh, the one that came, the one, <laughs> the one that came to mind first, um, is Claudius in Hamlet, um, who is, uh, a one's one. I think he's, he's the king who kills his brother. Um, he's Hamlet's uncle. And from the top of that show, and then later in an important moment in the show, Claudius is, um, is sort of working through the binder as it were like he's, he starts the, his first moment on stage is this sort of legal argument about sort of why we should be thinking the ways that we're thinking. And he just goes through a list. He's talking about, you know, why it's okay that we're moving on from the, the sort of funeral period uh, and why it's okay that he married Gertrude and, why it's okay that we're we're gonna go to war with Norway and 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 it's um um it's got that uh, he is he sees himself I think as a reformer um, yeah. mm-hmm. and he certainly deals with with anger and sort of um, uh, guilt um, uh, uh, certainly later in the play he's in he's in a confession he's in like he's he's confessing his sins and he's going through like one by one of the things that he's done, including killing his brother and a sort of wrestling with this thing that he thinks is wrong with him or defective. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And it's all tied to his actions and he can't really escape it. Uh, And so I, um, and he's a, he's a kind of leader uh, that, that the one, as I understand it tends to be, they they emerge, they emerge to the front of the group. And so um, Claudius is my, is my first one. And I, I've played Claudius before. Uh, and, and I understand the, the, the sort of anger and the instinctual thing. He kind of feels it. Um, uh, I don't know if this is Enneagram speak or not, but he feels it in his gut. He feels it mm-hmm. in his, yeah. in his body kind of yep. sits yep. in deep with him. Um, and so, yeah, that's my first one, Claudius. So I that's think I key to point out here is the fact that you, he's kept an account. Like he has a ledger of the things that he's done wrong or not done well enough. And that is a, is for sure, a theme for ones um, because that inner critic is not just like one little voice. It's like the judge, jury, executioner all in one. Right. And there it's always like sitting on the shoulder and like screaming, like things could be better. You could have done better. You need to do this right. Um, So I often tell people too, like if you think one is in the mix, but you don't struggle with an inner critic, (laughs) you can probably cross it off. Like, cause it is a like a legit thing. So. So that was the thing I noticed most when I was, so I, I came up with one for every Shakespeare play. Um, because I, you're I ambitious to prepared just in case. Um, and there were only three, there were only three plays in the canon where I literally, I went down every single character, even like the messengers and I could not find one person that seemed like a one. Mm. So we can talk about what the absence of oneness or at least like distinctive oneness means for those plays. Ooh. Um, but also like what I found is that a lot of the characters I was coming up with were leaders and a lot of them were like compulsive leaders like they really were like grasping onto authority even if they weren't actually that like high level like i do have some dukes and kings but i also have like malfolio oh. Angelo. i was i just wrote him down he was he was a late addition and i can't believe i forgot him yeah i think not, i think Malfolio, but i also think angelo and i think for measure for measure i think like these i think of the characters that like Ben Mendelssohn gets stuck playing yeah. these, like middle management villains that like just want the authority. Um, they just want authority. I feel like that's that to me is like what the what the bad one. It, that that's how it blossoms in my mind is this this like compulsive desire not only to 
to reform and make perfect, but the need to have power in order to accomplish the most. In mm-hmm. order to reform mm-hmm. the most, you need some kind of umbrella of influence. So power and control so, is a theme for body types, I will say, um, and different uh, ways. Um, the eight, the eight and the, they are everyone. Yeah, and so there's for each grouping of three in each of the centers or the triads, there's always, um, like a primary repressed or supporting sort of facet, or in other words, it could also be internalized, externalized or suppressed and completely detached from it. Um, so the one tends to be more of that internalizing component of the body triad. Uh, the eight is externalizing. <laughs> And uh, the nine is completely like detached, suppressed from them. And control is definitely something that they're very attuned to in different ways. So it's a good point. What else you got, Jeremy? Who else? Uh, Well, one of of the things that strikes me about most of the characters here, um, there's a legalistic part of this, right? So Mm -hmm. um, their perfectionism is about comparing to some ideal that they have in their head Mm-hmm. and um, uh, sort of arguing that out. Um, sometimes it's internally, but often it's it's um, when they struggle with other characters um, or their situation, they're, they're comparing what they're experiencing to uh, a narrative that they've invented in their head. And it's often thought in, in really legalistic terms. Um, and so uh, some of the other names I have on my list uh, our Iago, we will come back and talk to him because he's or talk about him. Uh, Portia in in uh, Merchant of Venice, Don Pedro in Much Ado About Nothing, Capulet um, in Romeo and Juliet, Bolingbroke in uh, Richard the Second, particularly. Well, I want to make sure we talk about and, Henry Ford. And, yeah. and uh, Helena. And the thing about all these, what's interesting about Bolingbroke, about Claudius, uh, about Portia, and about Helena. Uh, and Don Pedro is that they're all, they all appear as lawyers in some way. They're all mm-hmm. pressing a case at some point in those plays. Of course, Portia plays an, a, a, an actual lawyer, right? In disguise. Um, and Bolingbroke is arguably a, a, an actual lawyer in that play. Um, he's certainly a member of the court and is presenting a case and prosecuting a case. And so um, there's that prosecutorial feel to all of these or most of these, I think some are kinder and more generous of spirit about it than others. I think Portia is certainly one of those people, but the rest are um, assholes. Uh, that's the best way to put it, even though, I, I mean. I gotta defend my girl, Helena, for a second. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hel- oh, sorry, sorry, yeah, uh, she, uh, yeah. She's not an asshole, but she is a lawyer. One with the two wing. I'm going to jump in with the, you just said gray area. And I love that because that is one thing that one specifically, and also eights as well. There is no gray, right? It's black or it's white and that's it. There is no middle ground. Um, you know, that even you're talking about lawyers and I'm seeing, I'm envisioning the scales of justice, right? Like that is very clear it for a one specifically. And you're right, Jeremy, totally. It's, it could be an ideal in their head or it could be something that they have, you know, learned or accumulated over time, but it is very clear to them. Um, and then depending on their ability to sort of navigate humanity, <laughs> Is whether or not you can do that um, with compassion to others who maybe aren't there or in the same place as them. I think that's great. Um, some of the some of the language around like unhealthy ones, uh, self righteous, inflexible, um, obsessive, contradictory, uh, condemnatory, <laughs> punitive. I mean, these are we're falling. If you're a one, y'all forgive us. We're not trying to pick on you. <laughs> we'll do this for everybody. But a lot of times, people find their enneagram type based on like the stuff you're trying to hide, right? Because that's the whole point of your ego is to like hide stuff, right? And to, to you know, present this sort of character, um, which is, I just love that so many of these characters have such a structure that 
fits. You know what I mean? Like that, that this still is in tune, like it's in keeping with classic sort of personality structure. And it's fantastic. Um, um healthy ones are wise <laughs> and accepting balanced um there can be balanced it takes time it takes growth it takes learning that um and being like reasonable evaluating um your situations and principled um but in still like in a reasonable way so that's great that's great yeah i think i think that uh measure for measure is the great um I will defend till I die, which is that Angelo and Isabella are just two sides of the same coin, and they've got the same toolkit. Uh, the only reason she's not a lawyer is because she was a woman written by a 17th century author. Mm. Like, she would be a <laughs> lawyer if she lived today. Um, and their scenes are like the, the blueprint for every screenplay Aaron Sorkin ever wrote. Like it's like two totally like irreconcilable worldviews, and they think that if they argue long enough, they can like convince the other one. Um, and they're both they're both perfectionistic they're both reformers um and they both uh at various moments i think show um flashes of all of those traits that you just described especially the negative traits um there is uh this their scenes are prosecutorial and the they are both striving so hard to be principled that they're actually like inflexible often to like human compassion mm-hmm. um and and human empathy so uh i think that uh measure for measure is, is a facet like that's the play that keeps rising to my mind as we talk about the ones because i think angelo and isabella are both ones and the great tragedy of that piece is that like when they go head to head each one thinks that they can prevail and they will never be able to because they are so equally matched. That's tough. If you enjoy the work of Sweet Tea Shakespeare, you can find us all over the socials. We're on Facebook. We have a special secret Facebook community group that we'd love for you to join. Uh, We're on Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, you name it. We're on it. We're even starting TikTok. Uh, So join us click in, give us a like, uh, and we'll look forward to seeing you in all of those places. If you'd like to contact us, we urge you to do so at ours at sweetteashakespeare.com. That's H-O-U-R-S at sweetteashakespeare.com. Um, so Jeremy, I'm just going to, can I just list some of the characters that I had? I just want to get your thoughts. Sure. Because uh, I feel like, I feel like I'm learning so much more about the one just by having this conversation and by hearing Kelly talk about it. So some of these may not, no longer apply, but, um, for all's well, I also had Helena for, as you like it, I had Duke Senior, Duke Senior being the, the more wise, compassionate principal type of, of one, um, for comedy bears, I had Duke Salinas, uh, just keep control of his mad cap city. Uh, for Cymbeline, I had Cassandra Loves Labor's Lost. I had King Ferdinand of Navarre, and I will defend that one because I think that is absolutely, this is absolutely what he is. Because to me, to me, Ferdinand is Chidi from uh, oh, plays. He's oh. just stuck in a Shakespeare play. Um, yeah, Measure, I had Angelo and Isabella. Merchant of Venice, Portia. I, Mary Wives of Windsor was the first play where I couldn't think of a single character who was a one. And I wonder if that contributes to the general inanity of what happens in that play. Um, <laughs> Because there's there's no one who's trying there's no one who's trying to impose structure there's no one who's trying to like reform or control it's just fascinating, fascinating. I love it yeah love it. so um, much ado I also had Don Pedro for Pericles I had Marina um, who's striving so hard to be her principled virginal self even though she literally lives in a body house um, Taming of the Shrew I had Luc- Lu- is it Lucentio or Lucentio I don't know how to say his name. Depends on uh, which continent you live, I'm sure. <laughs> so, Lucentio, um, <laughs> uh, trying to impose, like, the ideals of um, romantic love that's, like, detached from economic uh, advantage. He's trying, to, he's trying to, like, incorporate that into Bianca's life. Um, for The Tempest, I had Antonio, uh, which is very similar to the, to the Duke Senior thing, except in Burst. Uh, for Troilus and Cressida, I had none, and I also think that that contributes to the 
like widespread bloodshed of that play because no one is keeping anyone else in check. Um, Twelfth Night, I have Malvolio. Two Gents, I have Sylvia. And The Winter's Tale, I have Polina. So those are my comedy characters. Um, and what was interesting to me in curating that list was I realized, like, wow, some of these characters, as you say, Jeremy, are assholes. And other characters we really, really want to believe in because mm -hmm. their ideals are, um, they're quite honorable, right? Like, Sylvia straight up tells Proteus when he comes wooing, she's like, you have a woman who loves you. You've, you've committed yourself to her. Go back to her right now. Rethink your life choices. Like, don't you dare woo me. Like, be a man of honor. Like, she has a speech where she tells him that. Um, and so I think that we can, what I like about this, uh, this Enneagram thing is that there is no, there's no single morality attached to it. Like, you mm -hmm. can be good and bad version of any type because that's how humans are and any quality that we possess, we can have it to an unhealthy degree or we can have it, we can not have enough of it. 100%. Um, yeah. And so I like, yeah, I liked the, the, the variety uh, of characters that, that were sort of, that made it under this umbrella. Um, but I think, I think your Henry Bolingbroke is spot on Jeremy. I think Henry four is like possibly like the quintessential one, <laughs> mm. at least of the history plays. Um, so what was, can you talk me through what was going through your head when you picked him? Um, well, well, I, I sort of center around his role in, um, in Richard the second more than anything, which is that, that sort of prosecutorial role. He sees Richard as, um, uh, um, too lax, too, um, um, decadent. Uh, and there's a, there's a sort of a, um, sort of a military posture about Bolingbroke uh, and a, um, and a follow the rules and, and his, his story is about restoring order. And of course uh, in, Hen in both of the Henry four plays, it's about maintaining order. Um, and so, I, and it's also actually about as, as is the case with so many of these characters, it's also about his guilt of having in order to restore the order that he, he wanted, he had to create disorder to do it and yep. depose a King and all of that. And so throughout the, the, the Henry four plays, we're seeing him uh, wrestle with this thing that he's done that is on one level, sort of counterintuitive for him. And, uh, and uh, he doesn't do a, uh, he doesn't do a, like a really great job at that. He wants to hold other people, to account uh, throughout those plays and, and does um, uh, I think, but he has trouble actually holding himself to account because he knows that in order to keep the rules, he's had to break the rules. And that's a really mm -hmm. lovely sort of tear apart of this character. I think. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. So I think, I mean, I think that's spot on. I also think that the great, uh, the great irony of, uh, and also kind of funny, his uh, his crusade to reestablish order in England and to to put a king on the throne himself, um, who will impose structure and order and principle. Um, <laughs> the the consequences of that are like so far reaching and so bloody and strewn with corpses that you just are left one, like you get to the end of the history play cycle and you're just left wondering, wow, was it worth it? <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's certainly what he's asking himself, like as he dies. And of course, another great irony is that he has a son who I would argue is an eight, but like pretends that he's a seven. Like he leans so far into his seven wing that he like pretends that that's what he is. Um, and of course a seven is, um, you know, chaos and Epicureanism, <laughs> like, and, and partying. And so, um, or yeah, might or he might be a really healthy one who's making a reach to seven, seven right? right. So. <laughs> yeah. His, uh, his own child who should be like the great white hope of his mission of Bolingbroke's mission of like reestablishing order in England. Um, for the for most for most of the Henry Ford plays, he embodies the opposite of that, mm. and so Bolingbroke is not only deep, not only reeling for, with the like political repercussions of what he's done, which creates a civil war that doesn't end for about a century, but also um, 
he has to face down the fact that like just because he holds these principles to be inalienable does not mean that his son is automatically going to feel the same um and that is what causes like the ultimate father-son tension of those plays is that Bolingbroke just wants his son to be uh the next iteration of him and his son is sort of uh telling him not so subtly dad I'm not you <laughs> and you can't make me you um for better or worse you can't make me you so um yeah I love I love thinking about Henry's oneness as like the head as his you know sort of the reason why he's able to accomplish as much as he does and, and attain the heights that he does and also like what what brings him low in the mm. end yeah it's a driving force driving i mean you can, I mean, can it's his it was his mission his, his mission, calling, calling right like he really not regardless of the means right <laughs> mm. 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 that's cool that's cool so in the tragedies jeremy i had from Ant i was thinking about auntie and cleopatra because you know how much i love that play um I was thinking of Octavian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's like the ultimate one. And his, like, what's so sad about him is that he's in a play with a bunch of freaking party animals. Yeah. And he's just trying to impose order. <laughs> it's it's interesting laying those two stories, you know, the, the bowling book uh, versus Hal and the Octavian versus Antony and Cleopatra is, yeah. is the same story, essentially. The perfectionist versus the epicures. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But the ages are flipped. Cause, yeah. Because Octavian is 21 and Antony and Cleopatra are like in their 40s. Where meanwhile, Bol Bolingbroke is the adult and Hal is the 20-year-old mm -hmm. screw-up. Um, the last play that I had with no, that I could not discern a one is Coriolanus. Because the only characters who try to like have this reforming perfectionistic ethos they're all secretly serving themselves. Like it's all kind of a front for actually just wanting uh, other things like for wanting like power, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem authentically rooted in the desire to like actually lead. It's just a desire to like uh, hoard power. And I don't know if that's mm. so much. I don't know. I don't know if that qualifies as a one. I guess it just depends on, just depends on what the perceived outcome of hoarding the power would power bring. bring. Um, um, you know, yeah, um, that's, um, yeah, that's a tough, yeah, one. That's a tough one. Jeremy, Jeremy thoughts. I'm, I'm not familiar with the characters. With the characters. That's, that's tricky. tricky. Um, I, I think I tend to agree. Although, um, um, uh, Volumnia, is that the, the mother? I, I she, she, she might scratch the itch a, a little bit, maybe. Maybe I thought she was a loyalist. She could, you could, you could be right. We'll discover that in the sixth episode. <laughs> <laughs> Some other, as you guys were talking, I had jotted down a few other like attributes or maybe like n names that folks attribute to ones: teacher, teacher, activist, activist crusader, 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 moralist, moralist. Um, and organizer are often um, kind of associated with that type. So I'm hearing all of these things. As you guys are talking. Sure, yeah, I yeah. think you're spot on. You're spot on. So yeah. I got Claudius. I also had Polonius mm -hmm. as a potential one. And that, to me, like, now I sympathize with Hamlet in a way that I rarely do. Because if you're running around with two ones, like Polonius and Claudius, if that's your, that's the force that you are constantly reckoning with. Like, I mean, I would want to lie around and, and make puns and kill people. Yeah, and I actually... Uh, <laughs> I think I agree. And I think the difference between Claudius and Polonius is that Claudius would be something like uh, a one with a nine wing, a peacemaking wing. And Polonius would be uh, one with a helper wing. Um, it, he's sort of like, run, you know, running around, pulling strings. And um, this got that sort of two manipulation quality yeah. about it. Do gooder. So. It's a do gooder. He That's tries really hard. Yeah. He tries really hard. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm surprised you didn't have this one, Jeremy, because this one to me was like the first one I thought of, which is Brutus in Julius Caesar. Yeah, that's uh, uh, see see as you say that I would like um uh see I Cassius strikes me as more of a one um. Uh, so 
there's something there though. I mean, there's a, there's this like, yeah. I think, um, uh, Brutus for me, Lance is, um, a sort of, uh, this is much more self doubt. Um, and I know the inner critic is part of the, the one here, but, um, I see him maybe as more of a withdrawn type or would like to be withdrawn at, yeah. like a five and may get sort of manipulated into, into something else. I like that. And you know, as you were speaking, I also, I also had to rethink because Kelly, what you were saying at the top of the show was that an, a, a common characteristic of ones is they're often right, which is really frustrating, but they're right. often right. right. And I think this like, Cassius is much more Machiavellian, but I agree with you, Jeremy, that like he he does have um, he has real politic instincts that if Brutus had just sort of maybe let him lean into a little bit more, um, they wouldn't have gotten uh, hosed the way they do. And also with Brutus, like I can't think of a single time in the play when he comes to a rational, reasonable decision and it's the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost always wrong. If he treats he like. He tries so hard and he thinks through everything so conscientiously um, that it feels it, it, watching him process it, it's, it seems impossible that he could be wrong and mm -hmm. he realized just how misplaced all of his um, all of his trusts are. So yeah, I like that. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna replace Brutus with Cassius. So also just to also provide just further points of clarification, Jeremy just mentioned withdrawn stances. <clears throat> Excuse me. That is another triad or grouping um, that we can attribute to the different Enneagram types. So there are three stances, and essentially that is how you deal with conflict. Um, there is the withdrawing stance, the dependent stance, and the aggressive stance. Um, so six, one, and two are in the dependent stance. Um, and you're dead on with the five. So five, four, and nine are withdrawing. So we're going to back away like, yep, I'm out. Um, and, then um, and then seven, eight, and three, seven, three are your aggressive stances. But what that means for the, for the dependent stances, they're going to either um, kind of anchor onto something and that is their guidepost, their, their thing. So the six would be the community, right? The one would probably be like this code, um, wherever the code exists. Um, but that's going to be their, um, their light, the thing that they follow, and that's the thing that they cling to um, wholeheartedly. Also interesting to note, um, often mistyped. Um, ones often mistype themselves as five, fours, or sixes. And they, the three. So this might be my problem. Jeremy, listen, I got you. <laughs> We're going to figure it out. Take notes. So threes sixes and sevens like to type themselves as ones like so it's so funny like certain enneagram types like i'm completely content with my type i love my type um but oftentimes especially my husband's an eight and he's always like i don't want to be an eight i want to be something else because eight seem like the jerks of the any right like in his but we all that's the point right we all think that we could be something better we all want to present as something else we don't want to see the shadows we don't want to see the garbage in our trunk you know whatever so three sixes and sevens like to type themselves as ones and let me circle back to my first statement often ones will mistype themselves as fives, fours, and sixes. So that five connection there is real. Um, and then the four has to do with the withdrawing probably. And then the six is the the morality, like the code often seems like a loyalist sort of community driven thing when oftentimes it's not, it's all about themselves and their, yeah. yeah. That, re that, that makes me think uh, back to somebody I've mentioned already, uh, which is Iago, who is the, this sort of, um, master manipulator um, puts himself in the, I th think he's one with the two wing, you know, he's, he's got that, the, you know, twos when we get there next time, they're like super manipulative. Like that's their whole thing. They, they, I mean, they can be, they can be better than that. They're too, the worst. Yes, <laughs> twos are the worst. <laughs> they're not so the maybe worst. I'm a two, <laughs> but um, this is not, Oh, it's not going well, <laughs> but he's, Mm. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder if um, yeah, she she's a, she could be a, a real counter type because um, 
she, uh, which we haven't talked about yet, but she, she really, she knows what the rules are and does not mind smashing them and rewriting her own, which I think is, um, which doesn't mean she doesn't have rules. I th- uh, for, for me, Iago is, um, he's, he, everything he does is about some kind of justice. It's just his version. You know, he feels like he's been sort of jumped over for promotion. He, fe- I, I think there's some, some great queer theory in Othello that, that can maybe unpack some, some of uh, Iago's inner guilt, particularly when he talks about the impropriety of uh, Claudio's behavior when they're bedded together. I think there's some, some great stuff. Cassio, sorry, I said Claudio, um, but Cassio, um, when there's a, he, some impropriety there, there's some, imp, uh, some uh, impropriety and justice issues he talks about or hints about um, with the idea that, that maybe Othello and his wife, Amelia have uh, liaised in some way. And he's, uh, he's obsessed with it and he's working behind the scenes to sort of rewrite the order. And of course, uh, I haven't mentioned uh, his, his racist and religious based beliefs there that there, that um, this outsider Othello is uh, in violation of all of those um, uh, that, that sense of justice that he has, of course it's misdirected completely. Um, But, but I think he's, he's one of these, too. He's, uh, and unlike one of these other characters like Claudius or Don Pedro, who's sort of outwardly prosecuting the case, I think Iago's, um, he's prosecuting it to the audience, but in terms of his activity and, and work behind the scenes, it's much more about manipulating things, uh, to create a new order to, to create a reform. scene when she walks in and she's like dad I love you as your daughter like of course I love you and I you know uh, I submit to you but the way that our world operates um, the moment I get married my loyalty is with my husband and this is my husband and you just have to deal with that um, and she doesn't she doesn't allow the um, disdain contempt outrage uh, all racist from Venetian society to dissuade her from the fact that like, not only is she within her rights to have married a fellow, but she's within her rights to defend that mm-hmm. publicly in front of the Duke. Um, and so to me, she seems like, uh, not so much the big picture, but like the, I think, I think a wing too, in the sense of like, she, she is trying to be radically compassionate. She's trying to normalize, uh, a, um, uh, she's trying to normalize her, her inter, interracial marriage as something that people should accept because morally mm. and principally, like, it is right. And so that is actually a fascinating way to read a fellow that, like, you have the worst one ever and the best one ever in the same play. You, I, I like the idea of, because I think, I think a fellow is, like, pure eight. Like, I think a fellow is, like, you know, quintessential eight. And he's, he's got these two ones on either side of him. And the really sad thing is that he listens to the, like, corrupt one instead of the morally, you know, righteous one. Yeah, and what, some of what you're saying about Desdemona rings with, uh, um, you know, the a phrase Kelly used or a term Kelly used um, describing ones as an activist, mm-hmm. which is yeah. which is kind of what, uh, that, what I hear you say, Desdemona, um, and sort of, in invoking this social reform and sense of justice yeah. is, is about, no, I think that works. You guys, you're going to die. I literally have this. So I have all my books. Cause I told you I'm a five. Um, I rely on competency. This is a quick plug for Chris Hewart's new book, but I literally have this open and I don't fully, I haven't fully ingested the concept, but ones and eights eight have a tie and that they play this. Um, he calls them luminary roles. Um, they can teach us balance because you've got them flanking either side of the body triad, right? This instinctual sort of um, everything about the body triad is access to anger. And what do you do with the anger? Right. And also like based on just the Enneagram shape in and of itself, they're kind of holding up the two sides of the tent. Right. Um, And all of their energy is pushing downward 
which is, which is has meaning has also, meaning but, also, but um, the um, two in tandem with each other and seen in context of each other, they're not connected otherwise, but they also, they teach us and they teach the rest of the system balance. How do we find a balance between the two extremes? I, don't, I just like literally was reading that today. Um, I will dig into it a little more by the time we get to eight and be able to explain it more fully. But I think that's great because there's definitely some um, really unique ties there. I love that because that also, if you, if you incorporated this idea into a rehearsal room context, like that could be, that could go a long way for justifying why a fellow trusts Iago as implicitly and wholeheartedly as he does. Maybe on some subconscious level, like Mm -hmm. Iago, Mm -hmm. Iago's like, ethos reminds him of Desdemona mm. who mm. until and who until Iago wreaks havoc is the person a fellow arguably trusts most in the world. <laughs> this is cool. Okay. So here's the, here's the other thing that I keep coming to as I as I as I'm thinking about this which is um uh so I come from the p- posture that Shakespeare is writing plays, not like out of the blue, not like he had just had these ideas one day to just write these characters and these stories, but actually he's basing his writing on the actors that he has in his troupe and their mm-hmm. skill set and, and what they bring to the table. And so he has people in his troupe who he knows can do the, um, the lawyerly thing that we're talking about or the advocacy thing that we're talking about. Um, and, and, uh, or that sort of, um, there's a kind of, uh, forwardness, uh, and precociousness to this one, uh, that, that, um, resonates with so many of these characters. Uh, and so, so it, what, one thing I would, I would love to do in a time machine is go back and see how many of these characters were played by the same people. Oh. Uh, and, wow. um, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, and I think certainly like when you're looking at a Claudius and a Don Pedro and a Capulet, there's a, and even a Bolingbroke, there's, there's an argument to be made that that's probably arguably anyway, one actor, right. That's playing those parts. And with some of the, some of these uh, female characters, um, they're written at different times. So it's unlikely that the boys coming, coming up out of the, out of the schools would have been the same across um across most of these plays, but there is a sort of um, forward kind of student, like I'm really good at this. I just came out of school. I know what all the arguments are in sort of classical rhetoric, which is what they would have been trained in. Like the, the playwright seeing those qualities and shaping the character around the actor as well. Something I think that could be pretty fascinating. And I wonder then uh, to, to some of the plays that Claire, has identified as maybe not having a one, if that's a sign that maybe um, that actor was was on a break or they they didn't have a person <laughs> of that quality, you know, in the troupe at that time, they'd cycled out or they'd moved on or whatever. Um, it's just something I, I keep thinking about. It's so interesting because you keep mentioning Capulet. The one that I had for RJ was actually Prince Aeschylus, not Capulet. Mm. Um, I, I struggled to... Because Capulet to me doesn't, he doesn't seem to be actively trying to reform or improve anything. It seems like he's, he's responding in real time to the disfavor that the Capulet family has fallen into after the street crawl. So he's like, I gotta rush up this marriage that yeah. I was gonna let, was gonna let happen slowly. Like, I'm just gonna throw it together now so that we can reclaim some legitimacy in the eyes of the, you know, of the, the government. But um, Aeschylus to me seems like the one who's like actively trying to, reform the one who's trying to impose some kind of structure with very little success or efficacy, but he is trying. Um, but I think it's interesting, like, but maybe you have a point because I don't know what I would type Capulet as. I, I definitely agree with you that, that Aeschylus is a, is a law and order type. And that certainly resonates with here. The, the, what draws me to Capulet in particular um, is he does have uh, a sense of, um, idealism with regard to his daughter and her behavior. Uh, I, I do think. And, um, and the, the sort of law and order of the house, what makes me think of what, what makes me um, imagine Capulet is actually seeing where the arrows go um, with a one. So 
it goes to um, a four in stress and a seven in integration. And I think there are so many things that Capulet does when he goes into stress. So, so four is like the, perf, uh, the performer, the artistic type. And, and I can see him in getting ready for the party and he's sort of stressing out and, and managing the servants and, it, and, and wanting the image of that to be, it's kind of an artist. It's what, a, it's a, what a director yeah. does. Yeah. When they're so, putting on a play and there's that kind of quality to it. But then there's the, the opposite of that is that when that party starts to go well, he's moving into integration and it is a party. It, he is an Epicurean. He is sort of this weird, he becomes this weird sort of um, cartoonish, uh, like father of the bride type <laughs> of like slightly drunk and I having a ball and so that's what that's what made me think of of Capulet there. So um, in a a one goes to four, and so what that means, you guys, if you're unfamiliar with how you move to stress, like you have access, you could reach into another type, right? So what what I'm hearing Jeremy say, like ones when they get stressed out, they become really judgmental. They're rule followers. Their world is on fire. They're like ah, so they need something else. They need something else to help get their needs met, fulfill their uh, desires, whatever. So then they move to four, and you can either do that in a good way, on the high side of four, you could do that in a bad way, or an unhealthy way, or a uh, unintentional way. Um, but what that does to a one is that teaches them how to name their anger. First of all, the resentment, whatever's going on, they get to learn emotional language. Um, and they get to learn how to name their anger, um, on the high side, if it's a good move, quote unquote, um, they are able to embrace imperfection, right? Screw it. It's a party, <laughs> right? Um, let the kids color outside the lines, all that kind of stuff. Um, Name your emotions, embrace your creativity. When you do that in a low move, when you go to the low side of four, um, you become dramatic, moody, and super irrational. Um, when you normally that's have Capulet. that to cling to. In the, yeah. in the bedroom, that's Capulet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, The, the 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 figure that comes that 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 strikes me at the moment as as the oneiest in that play is Lear, um, and I'm not saying he is a one, but the but that opening scene is so much about his his reading of a of a kind of justice about how his daughters ought to be treating him. I don't think it's rational. Don't get me don't get me wrong there, but there is a. There is a sort of uh, there's a prosecutorial feel. There's a lawyerly feel. This is this this is the way it's going to be. Um, but um, that that character um, uh, probably cycles through all all sort of nine motivations as as someone who is sort of increasingly detached from reality. And so um, he's one I'm going to have to think about some more. But I do think there are some there are some qualities there certainly. And interesting, as I say that out loud, sorry, um, uh, Cordelia is it has some of those qualities in the first scene yes. um, as she presses back against dad. And that's really interesting and, and a sign for me of, of their connection and their sort of strong headedness um, that they have in common. Yeah. She is, she is stubborn to a fault. 
I don't know how you can, I don't know how you play her any other way. Like, I know she's been the, the wilting lily for all of time, but like that, I, I don't know how you can read the text and, and play her that way because she is, she's like pig headed and she obviously gets it from her dad. So, yeah. so stubbornness is a really strong nine trait. Um, so that would be, that could be the one wing nine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, we, we did that production a couple of years ago and our, our good friend, uh, Jim Pomeranke played Cordelia uh, oh. as herself, if you know what I mean. And so <laughs> that, that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> the, 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 yeah. So uh, Jen, if you're listening, take that for what you will. <laughs> well, we are, we're coming to the, coming to the end of our hour, but this has been so much fun. I, I'm so excited to do this whole series with you guys. Right. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for joining me today. Uh, Kelly, thank you so much for all your amazing research and for being our brilliant moderator through all of this. Moderator. <laughs> I'm learning. I'm learning. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for the Sweet Tea Shakespeare Hours. We are produced by Claire Martin and Jeremy Feebig. Our theme song is by Owen Eddy. Ashanti Bennett is our general manager. Jen Pomeranke assists with each episode. This episode is edited by Ashanti Bennett.